be nice to see everybody on this Monday morning. Um, as be, has become our uh, tradition in this group, um, we're going to sort of take a big breath in and a big breath out to let go of anything you're holding, um, your to-do list for the rest of the day, any loose ends from yesterday, any loose ends in your household as you're getting ready for the week and be ready to be present this morning with our topic, which is possibility, responsibility, and limitations of teaching. And we're really privileged this morning to have two of my favorite colleagues, um, Dr. Susie Tanchel, Dr. T, Susie, and Rabbi Dr. Michael Shire, who will share with us this morning. Uh, before we get started, though, with our topic for this morning, I wanted to take a minute to um, acknowledge SIGD, which how many of you have heard of SIGD? People are shaking their head, people raising their hands. So, and it's, um, how about put in the chat if you haven't heard of SIGD, um, which I actually, I don't know how I'm not seeing the chat right now, but I'll figure that out. So I'll, I'll take a look in a minute. But so SIGD is, um, an Ethiopian Jewish holiday, or uh, let me put it this way, it's a Jewish holiday that the Ethiopian Jewish community has celebrated and acknowledged for years, generations, millennia. Um, it comes from an interpretation that they have from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and it acknowledges, it marks 50 days after, um, whoops, after Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, thank you. I just, I wanted to switch my slides so that you could see my beautiful photographs of Sig being celebrated in Judaism, in Jerusalem. So it, it acknowledges, it, it marks that 50th day after Yom Kippur and sort of should, that should be an echo to you of other holidays that we count 50 days, seven weeks, um, certainly an echo of Shavuot, um, 50 days after uh, Pesach. Um, and what SIGD acknowledges for the Ethiopian community, and hopefully for those of us that will begin to take this practice on possibly, is a time of repentance and renewal, sort of like marking the end of the entire uh, sweep of the high holiday season of introspection and renewal and a time to come back to the community. And for the Ethiopians, it really also marked a time to acknowledge Jerusalem and the longing for Jerusalem, the longing for reuniting as a people. And of course, in the 20, 20th century and 21st century, that realization of reuniting in the holy city and in the holy land in Israel, um, in the modern state of Israel came to fruition. So what I wanna do, and I'm gonna ask everybody to, to get up out of their seats. I'm going to play a little um, YouTube of some SIGD music and we'll boogie a little bit to get in the SIGD um, mode. We'll connect with each other in community here as we dance away and boogie to the music. So I hope I can do this um, with, I think I have to, hold on. Is anyone hearing that yet? No. Did you hear that? As I start, not yet, okay. Marion. Okay, so I have to stop sharing and reshare, I think. So let me see how. Hey, how about now? Do you hear the music or do I need to share my microphone better? No, Marion, is there a little, when you hit share screen, is there a little box at the bottom that says share computer sound? You can check. Yeah, I box. have to get to that. Um, advanced sharing. Actually, it should be on your basic share. Yeah. Uh, um, when you first start sharing, before you choose yeah. the screen, way at the bottom. Yep. Share computer sound. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for your help with that. Of course. Okay. Uh, please install. I, sorry about this, but it's telling me I have to reshare. got it. We can hear it. OK, 
Okay, goody. <laughs> Are you paused it now? Yep. Okay. We were all just starting to groove, Marion. <laughs> okay. Sorry, obviously computer glitches. Is it just the called Siggy on YouTube? I might be able to bring it up for us. Oh no, she's frozen. Deb, do you have the video? No, okay. Marion, are you still oh. hearing it? I, I thought I was, yeah, and I can right hear here. it now, and I thought we're... <laughs> Not yet. I think you paused it. Here we go. Oh, come on, guys. Get up and move. Ferret and Sandy and Elena. <laughs> Sandy, get your yacht out now before the day starts. All righty. <laughs> Sorry for the, um, the glitches, but hopefully everyone got a little bit into the SIGD mood and feeling connected to Jews around the world and in our own little community this morning. Um, so let's be all thankful um, that we live in a time when Jews around the world have YouTube and can share their traditions that way. Um, thanks everybody for playing along. Um, I'm gonna reshare my screen as I turn it over to Michael, just to give everybody the agenda, which I think Debbie, did you put the agenda in our um, chat yet? I did. I can repost it if not everybody sees it. Okay. And I will, um, I have three links of articles about SIGD that um, Debbie's going to put in the chat as well. So you can uh, do a little background reading if you want. So I'm now finally seeing the chat. So just Amy Deutsch, do you feel like you have enough little bit of information about SIG now? That was great. Yeah, thank you. Good. You're welcome. Okie doke. All right, Michael, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, great. I uh, hope you can all hear me. That's okay. Uh, good morning. W wonderful to be with you all. Uh, now that we've got some, uh, some movement and music to start us off the week. Um, in fact, I was just looking on my Jewish calendar and SIG is, is right there on the, the day, but in tiny little letters, which I would never have noticed hadn't, hadn't it been for you, Marion, and everyone else. So thank you for that. Uh, I want to tell you a Monday morning story. I hope that's okay. Um, but before I do, I just want to say a little bit about the story. We've all now been teaching via Zoom for a long period of time. And I have to tell you, honestly, and between friends and colleagues, that I'm finding it difficult to find my voice as a teacher in this mode. You know, we've done a lot of work on the technology and learning how to use it and manipulate it and continue to, to learn how to do that. We've, um, we've done a lot of work on thinking about the orientations of our students and those we're teaching and the changed circumstances that they are in. And we've done a lot of work on trying to connect with our students, the relationship between teacher and student. And that's been all about them. And I must say, I find it difficult to now focus on, on me as a teacher. Who am I as a teacher? What is it that I want to say in this time? Parker Palmer reminds us in his book, Courage to Teach, that we need to have integrity to be able to be a teacher. And what he means by integrity is a connection of all the things inside of us that come together as a whole so that we will be an undivided self. So the questions for being, for being a teacher and for being a teacher in this time is not 
what do I want to teach? And it's not about my performance and it's not about how good I am at manipulating all the, the tech, but it's who, who I am. What is my relationship to the Torah that I want to teach for our time? What is my relationship to that which is sacred and holy? And how do I want to give Judaism the opportunity to direct my life and to share that with others? What is it that I find of value in our Jewish experience, our Jewish tradition and its texts that direct my life and enhance the quality of what I have to say? But if I'm gonna do that, I'm really going to need courage. Uh, and Parker Palmer's book is called The Courage to Teach. And with that courage comes vulnerability to be able to share that with you and with all of my students. So when looking for ways to teach, I need to think about those ways that will enhance who I am, my voice, to bring my voice out and to find it uh, and to be able to refine it and to express it for this moment in our teaching careers. So he <clears throat> here, here is our story. There was once a, a great teacher, beloved teacher in a congregation, but he was retiring and after many years of service leaving, the congregation had learned a lot from him, a lot of wisdom. They thought about life's journeys through him and he had taught his Torah. So they wanted to find an ideal replacement, someone who would be just as he was. And so they came up with the perfect solution. They appointed his son. His son came to teach in the congregation. They all thought it was the perfect solution to their problems. After a time, however, they noticed that the young teacher was different from his father. He taught differently. He gave them different Torah. And the congregation were perplexed. Indeed, they were confused. They took him aside and they asked him, why don't you teach like your father? Why are you doing things differently? But the young teacher replied to them, you've got it wrong. I'm doing exactly what my father did. He never imitated anyone, and I don't imitate anyone either. I have my own voice. Thank you and good morning. Beautiful, Michael. Yasha Koach. Janice, were you raising your hand or were you shaking, waving? Yeah, <laughs> clapping. Michael, Yasha Koach, beautiful thought. And thank you for sharing so honestly and vulnerably. I think we all are feeling the, the stressors and sort of trying to find our own voices during this time um, in this environment of being online all the time. So thank you so much. Um, Susie, I am going to turn the um, session over to you. Susie's gonna share a piece of text with us, which Debbie, if you can put the- Oh, Google not yet, not yet, not yet. Okay, not yet, not yet. Okay, so you'll tell Debbie when to share the link, okay? Great. Great. Okay, so it's all your, you're on. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, Michael, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Polka Palma. And um, I'm just wondering, I haven't thought about it before, but I was just wondering, and not for this moment, obviously, the connection between um, Heschel's comment about we don't need textbooks, we need text people, because, you know, that's who the students are going to read. And I'm wondering how that connects up with Parker Palmer's idea of integrity, because uh, being whole also matters for when people read you. So I don't know, just interesting. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Susie. I don't know uh, if you have any idea why I'm showing up this morning. Do they, Marion? Whoops, sorry, I was still, I was muted. Um, yeah, you're our teacher this morning. I think I've been, I introduced you to the group uh, last time or the okay. time before. Some people, right, some people uh, weren't here for that, but um, yeah. I'll just very quickly say that uh, I am 
uh, newly appointed vice president of community education for Hebrew College, which is why I'm here. Uh, I do know some of you from uh, from an earlier part of my life, but uh, so thank you for the warm smiles and welcome. Um, but there are many of you I don't know. So um, I don't want to, since you probably all know each other, I won't take your time. Uh, oh, Marion's like, maybe not. Yeah, I think if you want to do some, I mean, we have a lovely group that's Boston based. Beth is one of our alum from Florida who's been coming to these sessions. So she maybe knows everybody at this point, but so, and Elena's new today. Okay, so if you want to do something, feel free. Yeah, so I just want to do a very quick uh, whip around of just your name, um, where you work in your role. So your name, where you work in your role and just one word about how you're feeling in this moment. And um, should I call on people? Do you, you wanna do that, Susie? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, Mike, uh, Sandy. Hello, <clears throat> hello. I am um, rabbi educator at Bethel Temple Center in Belmont. And um, I'm ready to be inspired by you. I was really happy that you're teaching this morning. <laughs> no pressure. Thanks, Andy. No pressure. <laughs> uh, Beth. Hi, I'm Beth Penimacore. Um, originally from Massachusetts. I'm from Worcester. Um, and I graduated with, um, in, with a dual bachelor's master's from Hebrew College in Jewish education. I am at Temple Beit Hayam in Stewart, Florida. I'm the director of ed and the cantorial soloist. And today I'm feeling um, rested and inspired. Great, Amy. I'm Amy Deutsch. I am the religious school director at Temple of Habish Shalom in Brookline. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling Monday, pretty Monday today. Yeah, right. Tiferet. Hi, I'm Hi. Tiferet, hello. Um, I'm the rabbi of congregational learning and programming at TBZ in Brookline. Um, graduated from Hebrew College, did the rabbinical and master's thing. I'm working on my doctorate in educational leadership at Leslie. Pretty excited. And I am feeling grateful. I'm just feeling really grateful this morning. Thanks, Steve Harrett. Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy Whitecross from Temple Isaiah in Lexington, and um, I am the B'nai Mitzvah coordinator, Tichon Isaiah coordinator, our high school, uh, sixth grade teacher, and part of Hebrew College Institute for Jewish Spirituality cohort. Thanks, great. Roberta. Hey, everyone. Good morning. My name's Roberta. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Education at Temple Israel of Boston. Um, I too am a graduate of Hebrew College, um, the MJ Ed program. Um, and I think you said one word about how we're feeling this morning, but sorry, that was a long intro and I already forgot. But um, I'm feeling Monday too, Amy. I think I feel unmotivated a little, I'm, if I'm w willing to admit that, which I guess I just did. Thank you. <clears throat> Elena. Hi, I'm Elena Moen, and I I teach uh, kindergarten and first grade Hebrew and Temple Beth Abraham in Nashua, New Hampshire. So, Great. Welcome. Thank you. Janice. My name is Janice Knight. I'm the congregational educator at Shirat Hayam in Swampscott. And I am feeling energized. Well, it must have been the dancing. <laughs> Susie. Hi, I'm Susie Rodenstein. I've been teaching at Hebrew College, uh, lucky me, since 1987. And uh, I am feeling incredibly excited about Susie Tanchel being part of our family at Hebrew College, bringing her energy and her wisdom of uh, both experience and learning to everything that she does. So thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, am I reading that correctly? 
You are. Good morning. I'm good morning. Jerry, I'm Jerry Robbins. I am a 2013 Cantor Educator graduate of Hebrew College. Um, nice to see so many of you this morning. I am the Congregational Cantor at Bethel Temple Center in Belmont. I am the Director of Education at Temple Chai Shalom in Easton. I am the second, third, and fourth grade uh, Judaica and Hebrew teacher at uh, Habai Shalom with other colleagues, and I, in my spare time, have some private students. And other than that, I have no involvement in the Jewish community. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to use two words too. I'm exhaustedly optimistic. Hmm. Wow, I'm going to have to ponder that later. Exhaustedly optimistic. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning. I'm Andrea Cates. I'm the education director at Temple Shalom in Medford. I'm also a teacher at Shirat Hayam in Swampscott with Janice and also a B'nai Mitzvah tutor. So depending on which day of the week it is, um, that's what I am. And I'm grateful for the fact that I just went for a great swim and I'm feeling energized. Wow. Thank you. Wow. A swim in like a fresh body of water? A swim at the JCC pool in Marblehead. Oh, okay. Inside. Whew. All right. Debron, how are you feeling this morning? I am feeling good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think everybody here knows me, but hello to anyone who doesn't. Um, I am the administrative manager for the master's degree at Hebrew College. All right. Michael, you want to add a word about how you're feeling this morning? I was going to say, uh, I'm being lit by the sun, which is both a physical thing, but also an emotional thing. So that's how uh, I'm feeling. Nice. And how are you, Marion? I am feeling really good to have put some energy into pulling this together and to now seeing it actualized. So I'm really happy. <laughs> All right. Okay, so lovely people. I am I'm really excited to be here and to hear just how how broad the network is here uh, across Boston and even across state lines. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I am going to uh, learn with you this morning, a text from Masachat Sanhedrin that um, I was actually taught in a teacher educator program also uh, many long years ago. It is uh, one of my favorites um, and maybe we'll discover why in a little bit. So Deb, if you wouldn't mind please sharing uh, the text and I'm hoping people have a, a pen and paper that they can um, write a little bit. So whenever you're ready, Deb. It's there in the, the chat now and it's a Google doc, okay? So if you want to make, maybe if you want to make your own notes, you can copy it and um, save it yourselves, okay? Oh, so it's a- Do you want me to share it on the screen too? I do. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Just so people, we can have it in front of us when we're talking, because otherwise people have to flip screens. Yep. Okay. You see that now? Yeah. Can you make it much bigger for mm -hmm. those of us who are? Mm -hmm. I sure can. So as Marion is figuring out the technology, um, I'm going to just share a little bit of background about this text. Um, why I chose it is because it is about teaching other children, other people's children Torah. So I am in the business of teaching other people's Torah, children Torah. I'm assuming you all are too, yes? Okay. So um, it's it's an invented conversation. So it's not it's not like, well, I would say it's not like what all of us do all day long, but those might feel invented sometimes too at this moment because we're not all sitting together around the table. But um, but this is a, a conversation that the editor of the Talmud brought together uh, different opinions on this question. And the reason that we know that is because the rabbis, Marion, I'm not going to be able to see that. So I need it much bigger, please. Okay. Um, so the rabbis that are quote, ah, there we go. Thank you. The rabbis that are quoted um, live in, in different times in different places. So I'm going to just give you a tiny little bit of their biography. And then I'm going to, I'm going to pose some questions and we're just going to talk together. 
Everybody with me? Woo, okay, here we go. Okay, first, the first rabbi that is cited is Reish Lakish. And um, he's from the third century. I'm a Bible scholar, so, so this is all like modern, modern times for me, the third century uh, CE. And uh, he began life um, as a bandit. And the reason why I'm giving you a little bit of biography is because I think that sometimes people's, or always truthfully, people's interpretation of text is in part a reflection of who they are and what their life experience has been as they walk through the world. That is part of the power of, all, of uh, interpreting our sacred texts. So uh, he began life as a, a bandit. And um, despite that, he is known for um, intellectual and moral honesty. So apparently he went through a rebirth uh, once he found um, Rabbi Yochanan. Re um, number two is Rabbi Elazar. And he lived in Israel in the second half of the first century. And he is known for his brilliance and for his interpretations of Torah and Chidushim and generating new knowledge. So very, very different from uh, Reish Lakish. And then the last one is Rava, who actually lived uh, in Babylon. So outside of the state, of, outside of uh, the land that we now call Israel. Um, and he was no, he was a charismatic guy who was known for his logical arguments and really was a public leader. Okay, so that's very little about each of them. But now I would like us uh, to read the text out loud, and then I'm going to pose some questions. So can I have somebody, one of you, just read um, each of the rabbis? So somebody for Rachel Akish. I can read. Great. Um, Rachel Lakish said, with regard to anyone who teaches Torah to the son of another, the verse ascribes him credit as though he formed that student. As it is stated, and Abram took Sarai, his wife, and the souls that they formed in Haran. Should I keep going? Just, just for one more sentence. They are given credit for forming the students to whom they taught Torah. Rabbi okay. Eliezer. Well, no. Okay. Great. Okay. So that was Rachel Lakish. Okay. Somebody else. Rabbi Elazar. I'm happy to read. Rabbi Elazar says, it is as though he fashioned the words of Torah themselves. As it is stated, observe the words of this covenant, Basita Motam, indicating that studying the Torah is like fashioning it. Great. Thanks, Annie. And number three, Rava. I'll read. Rava says, it is as though he fashioned himself as it is stated, the Asitamotam. Do not read the Asitamotam as, and you shall fashion them. Rather, read it as the Asitam Atem, meaning you shall fashion yourself. Great. Thank you so much, T. Ferret. So, any sort of clarifying questions before we go a little up from this level? Okay, I'm gonna take silence as not a sign of disinterest, but as a sign of you have no questions at this moment. Would that be accurate? Okay, so um, let's, let's see if we can put into our own words what is implied in each of these rabbi's opinions about what it means to teach somebody else's child Torah. How, if you had to, had to sum up each of the opinions in your own words, um, what do they think about the teaching learning process? How do they understand it? It's personal. There's some part of it that imprints uh, the text on the person. So which one, whose who's opinion are you summarizing at this moment? Well, it seems like all of them. So, you know, Reish Lakish 
um, is, you know, in thinking of the wonderful introduction that you gave to all of them, Ray Schlock, he's just like, you know, that that person is forming that student. So like, you know, they're putting that Torah on the student. And then Rabbi Elazar is saying, you know, that person is in teaching Torah, they are, you know, giving shape to those words of Torah in their in their teaching. And I think less so with Rabbi though. I, I, see, I see a bit of a, I, I very much agree with you, Ferret, that it's about it's, something happens to yourself and something gets transferred to the other person. I see three kinds of uh, stages. Reish Lakish sees it as just the, the act itself of the, of the sort of sharing the text, um, that that forms the student. Rabbi Elazar sees that you know, you do something to the text when you're trans when you're transmitting it, and the last is uh, and Rabbah sees that something happens to you and the text. So it's like you know, Reish Lakish, like you could even say like Reish Lakish is the Peshat of just I share the text. Um, Elazar is I take on and I interpret and I bring something with me that I bring to the text, and the last is. Rava is, I bring something to the text and then something happens as well out there in the world. Thank you. Michael, were you gonna jump in? Um, I, I was just thinking about the verses they're bringing for their arguments. Uh, and interesting that Reish Lakish brings a verse that talks about bringing people into the community from the outside as he was, as you said. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, Rebbe Elazar uses the notion of breach of covenant um, for those who are who see themselves inside that who see themselves inside that covenant and uh, participating in it. And, and Rava um, does something different with the verse. I'm not quite sure how that works, but it just seems that they're they're using verses that that do bolster their their own sense of who they are as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Rava does it by saying, you know, he was a charismatic guy and sometimes charismatic guys have healthy egos. And I think his suggestion is it's, it's, about, it's about me. It's about the teacher, you know? So I think they, they all kind of line up with, uh, with their own ideas. Anybody else wanna, wanna say uh, anything about either one of them or all of them together? Yeah, Susie. Um, I would just add that um, whoever you're talking about, whoever is speaking here, it's a dynamic process. So when you're teaching, you hope to have some influence on the students that you're working with, although it might be a little presumptuous to say that we form them because there are so many elements that go into forming our students, including themselves, uh, discovering what it is that they are uh, meant to be. Um, but um, we're also in a dynamic way affecting the actual words of the learning because when we read a text, when we share a text, when we play with a text, we're actually bringing it alive. So that's very dynamic. And uh, that text may not be alive in the same way for different generations in the same way, but we can always bring it to life. Um, and I think that um, you know, it reflects the Mandel Teacher Educator Institute uh, training that some of us had even in Rava's statement is that it does affect you. So when we mentor someone, it absolutely, when it's working well, also affects us. And we are also changing along with the learning and learning, learning it differently and in a new way every time. Totally, totally. Yeah, Jerry, yeah. Um, so I'm always fascinated by the distinctions among the creation words, um, Osa and Yatsar and then Bara, the idea that there's a creation that's so holy and reserved for God in bara, like bara sheet, bara Elohim of Basel. Um, and the, it's not yatsar like forming from nothing, but it's osa like making or doing. And so I think that there's also some sense of 
maybe the doing together mm. the, and um, the, you know, I want to say becoming, but uh, that's not really in the Hebrew. Um, and then also uh, that we do first and then we develop a level mm. of understanding, which neither, which none of them um, cite. So just. Well, I am going to go there in a moment of kind of like which, what is what is missing from 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 their equation. But but before before we get to that, I'm curious about in each of these, uh, is there one that particularly appeals to you, or one that particularly repulses you as you think about how you are a teacher and a learner? Hmm. I, I really like Rava's, um, you know, just I, I'm taking, thinking about what you were saying earlier about Heschel um, and becoming a text person. And I'm really reading that into Rava's statement, you know, mm. you fashion yourself as the words of Torah that, you know, we're trying to transmit. Hmm. Interesting. Was someone else about to pop in it's yeah i think that it's it i think that i don't know i feel like each one of them has this, this underlying in parentheses um that they are studying the torah and fashioning it in order to pass it on to the next generation or in, in order to teach it to someone else so i don't think there's anything really bad about any of them like with rava you know, being kind of a little bit on the, uh, you know, conceited side that he wanted to learn it for himself, you know, learn for himself, but also um, that, you know, to be able to learn, you have to learn it yourself before you can pass it along to the next generation. So I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, being able to teach it and pass it along. What? I'm so curious, but before I get to you, Sandy, one second, Beth, where do you see conceited? I'm curious about that. I just think that, you know, with, um, you know, the you shall fashion yourself um, with Rava, um, you know, you sh sorry, you shall fashion them, but then you shall fashion yourself. So it, it's, it kind of leads me to believe that it's, you know, kind of self-deserve, self, I, I don't know how to say it. It's early in the morning. Um, yeah. <laughs> Self-aggrandizing. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just being able to, um, you know, I, I, it's obvious that he has to learn it himself before he can teach anyone else. So I think that that piece was missing originally and then it, and then it got put in there. Huh. That's really interesting. I, I read that part very differently. I don't read it as a as a preparation statement, right? Like you have to prepare, like everybody has to prepare before they, they teach it themselves. I read it more as a reflective statement that as a result of the, uh, what Susie was saying um, of the dynamic interchange, um, as a result of the dynamic interaction, um, there has been an effect on the teacher. And, and, and Dafka, the, the opposite of conceit, I would say, um, going to more to what Michael was alluding to uh, in the courage to teach, that that the stance would have to be one of um, vulnerability and openness. Okay. And in order to be affected, right? In order to be affected, mm -hmm. you have to actually open yourselves up. When I started teaching, um, very early on, I was very uh, totally committed, I would say, to the subject matter knowledge. And it took Sharon Feynman and Emzer Brandeis to teach me that there were actually students in the room, that uh, you needed to be open to what they had to say about the text. And so, um, so that that definitely recreated who I was uh, as a teacher. But Sandy, sorry, thank you for your patience. That's okay. It's funny as you were saying that I was thinking about that triangle of student, teacher, and subject matter, and I think that's true here. I think I like all three of them and imagine them playing with each other. And I think at any moment when you're teaching, there are parts of it where you're interacting with the students and the students are really learning and, you know, forming themselves, whether we're forming them or they're like in a process of changing and growing and learning. And then the text itself hopefully comes alive and 
you know, changes in meaning as we're teaching and also we're changed in the process. And I don't think it's one or the other, but it's a constant dynamic in the room of different moments are different pieces of this, depending on how we're teaching, how we're interacting with the students, what they are bringing to the conversation. Um, and so I like kind of the interplay of all three of them together. Right, the, the instructional triangle, I think is definitely, um, you can definitely see that here. And part of why I love this text is because I'm a person who deeply subscribes to ancient texts have modern resonance. And so this text was composed, you know, centuries and centuries before anyone, anybody uh, in the modern field of education came up with the instructional triangle. But yet here it is uh, sitting, sitting in our sacred texts. And right, that going back to, again, this idea of the dynamic inter interplay, that these things are constantly um, in dynamic interplay. And, and I don't know how, met, how many of you know um, the work of Ellison and Orit, Ellison uh, Cook and Orit Kent. Um, Some but, of you should be familiar with Allison since she worked with us for many years at Hebrew College. But yeah, keep going, Susie. Yeah. Okay, but th that that work that they do on um, pop, um, the pedagogy of partnership, I think underlies this very idea that these things are in uh, dynamic partnership for one, with one another. So. Yeah. Um, so I think Janice had her hand up before, so I just want to make sure we don't miss her. Great. Well, I was, I had appreciated what Jerry had said because it got me thinking about that word, uh, asa'an, and the, and the fact that the student and the teacher working together with the words of Torah are fashioning the meaning for their time. And, and it's always going to be different. Yeah, it's always going to change because of whatever we ourselves bring to the text, whether as student or teacher, and that can change within the moment as well. I, you know, I become the the student to to some of my students on occasion. Totally, totally, yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah, right. And that's that might even, some might even argue those are some of the most powerful educational moments. Yes, <laughs> yes, when. It never hurts to have a little and, uh, bit of uh, you know the, the humility, not only active, yeah, and and some ownership, and 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 that they are active. Oh, my connection is unstable. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you were in and out for a second, but you're good. Okay, um, that this that the the students are active participants in what is uh, what is unfolding to, uh, through the educational process. Um, so, is anything missing when you think about teaching and learning and what you do and what your kids do and what the text does, anything that you would add, even as this text, you know, speaks to our present, is there something that you look at this text and say, wow, if I were bringing a conversation about teaching other people's kids Torah, I would bring in this perspective. And you don't have a biblical, you don't need a biblical text to support your ideas quite yet. Janice, did you want to comment on that too? Where are the parents? Parents, right? Parents are critical partners in, uh, well, not less so in high school. I, in my 14 years of high school, I didn't see them quite as much as when I led a K through eight school. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Parents? Sandy? Sandy? I, would, I would just say the, the bigger context of what's going on in a specific time that, you know, here we are in the middle of a pandemic or we're teaching on Zoom um, or something, you know, we're yeah. something specific and where where does that teaching or how does that reflection come into? What Great. I, I would add also the, the context of the community of the, and the community of learners that, and just um, echoing Susie's appraisal and, um, uh, co comments about the Orit and Allison, you know, we learn and when we learn in Chavruta, and if that Chavruta is just two students, or if it's 15 students, we build on each other, and we learn from each other. And that's, to me, is missing here a little bit of the, the context for sure, but just that dynamic of others engaged in the same text. Right, children talking to children. I feel like that's a Stephen Sondheim 
lyric from somewhere, but I but I don't know his music well enough. But yeah, children talking to other children because um, that is. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen videotapes of um, Deborah Bull teaching mathematics, but if you haven't, uh, it's a treat. Get some popcorn and watch. You'll learn a lot. <laughs> um, but um, but that right, that perspective uh, is missing here, and that's I'm not. I am not a Tom. I am not a scholar of Talmud by any 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 stretch of the imagination um so so I you know I say that with all humility I'm not saying that as a as a matter of like oh I would add um that perspective in necessarily because the audience for whom this was written was was uh different maybe from who we are but certainly in our lens in the in the 21st century children talking to other children and having the teacher step aside step to the side a little bit i think um would just add to this text any other thoughts on something missing or what you would add susie yeah you're muted susie Susie Rodenstein, you're yeah, muted. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I would just add um, to what Marion said, uh, certainly the community of learners, but also the larger community uh, within which mm. learning takes place and the impact uh, of that larger community. Also, how you get to play with, enact the learning outside of just the classroom of learning. Mm. Have the right. community. Right. Especially now where, um, you know, a, a Jewish education is happening more and more in settings outside of a classroom. Right. right. Serious Jewish education is happening outside of a classroom. And and what that means for all of us and our careers and um, where we think about as educative opportunities, I think, is is uh, a conversation for another time, but potentially a very uh, rich conversation. So, um so I will, I will just end with, with the words of thinking about, you know, kind of what Michael was saying, this is, and Sandy, this is a different time, right? We're living in a global pandemic and um, what it means to be responsible uh, for teaching other people's children Torah is even, is even more challenging at the moment um, because we're reaching into people's homes. Our children are not with us in the same space. What, what is available to us uh, and to be able to reach them uh, is so different. So um, I just wanted to end with just some gratitude for what you all are doing because uh, there is nothing uh, more sacred, I think, than, uh, than really fashioning children, bringing new meaning to a text and the impact it has on us. And so uh, I'm just grateful to be in community with all of you who are, uh, who are teaching other people's children Torah. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity to learn together again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Yasha Kochech. Um, really lots of rich stuff to be thinking about. And we have um, a few more minutes. So I really want to open it up and sort of see if people want to think and share with, with everybody, both sort of things that, that, that Susie's teaching generates for you and certainly things that you're currently doing. I mean, I think, and where Michael started about you know, being on Zoom, maybe we have all the technology um, as down as we can, but, you know, wh where do we put ourselves? Where do we, where do we help create that community? What, what impact does it potentially have on the families, given that the kids are sitting in their kitchens and living rooms and bedrooms with their parents right outside the door or right across the table from them? So I'd really love to hear from the group. Um, any, any thoughts about that? about this sort of the, the possibility, the responsibility and the limitation of where, where we are right now. Any, any thoughts? Janice, were you trying to say something? You were talking to someone else. <laughs> Honestly, I was yourself. talking to myself because we should be so lucky the parents are sitting in the kitchen with them uh, while we're trying mm. to teach on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what people's experience is, because that's my image has been in the few classrooms that I've been observing and I've seen parents in the background. Um, but I'm curious to hear people's experiences. Roberta. Um, I think it really depends. I, I just like I said, a super wide range of parent engagement in our community generally, and that's no different now. Um, <laughs> in fact, in some ways, it's like there's a broader highlight. Um, 
you know, because um, the kid that's not participating, their like video off is, is off and they're on mute and the parents hard to reach even in the moment um, when the administration is, is alerted to the class. Um, but a lot of times there is a parent there and I've had such in-depth conversations about curriculum and content um, and lesson plans um, with some families, but I don't want to say like that's, I don't know, maybe our community is so big that we have a, a diverse representation, um, but for sure I would say it's mixed, at least at Temple Israel. Mm, and those kinds of deep conversations, they happen, the parent or you reach out after the fact, is that how that's been happening? I, I don't know if someone else wants to jump in, if anyone else has been having these conversations, but yeah, um, a lot of times it's about um, something ha that happened after the fact. I know there are certain parents that I'm like in touch with regularly at this point who really are like sitting in on the classes and have lots of questions, sometimes feedback, but like, I wanna be really careful. Honestly, these are mostly helpful conversations even when they're criticism because what I think what Janice said is true. Like, um, I think Janice might be making a comment like, oh, I wish that were the case. And, but it is so fantastic. Um, I think many of you know um, Rabbi Susie Jacobson, but that's why I work with at TI and she and I just have been so glad to have these conversations with parents, like in-depth conversations about curriculum that we never would have had the ability to have because they're sitting there listening. Um, mm. but, I just, but, but there is the other frustrating side as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Beth, go ahead. So I think we've had some really different types of, of, um, of experiences because every few weeks we have a drive-through on Sundays where the parents and the children come in and they park their cars in the driveway in, in the parking lot. And um, Rabbi and I do a small tefillah and they, they get little bags and of things that they need to use for the virtual learning. Yesterday, um, it was pouring, pouring, pouring rain down here. So we decided as long as everyone was masked up that they should come inside, um, which is the first time we've had people inside the building. Um, so we went into the sanctuary and everyone sat as a, you know, in, in their own family units, socially distant and totally masked. And my whole being changed and Rabbi's whole being changed because we had people in front of us. And Jerry, I know that you go through the same thing with being a cantor and, and myself, a cantorial soloist, where we're doing virtual you know, Shabbat services every single week. And, um, and it, it's, it's really, you know, it's, that's why I said I was kind of rested this morning and inspired because we saw people on Sunday. And yesterday I had like these huge Hanukkah swag bags for everybody. And some of the teachers added to those swag bags and everyone was so excited to be together and to see one another. And I think that um, if we just did, if we didn't do these drive-throughs every once in a while, we, we would, it, it's very stressful. It's been really stressful. And we, our religious school was literally cut in half because of the pandemic. Mm. So, it's, you know, I feel like I'm working more as an administrator than I am as a teacher sometimes. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I, I feel your the energy just, you know, I'm craving being in a room with yeah. people and interacting. And as much as, I, you know, as an adult and someone who has been doing um, virtual learning and teaching for so long, I, I know I am in relationship with all of you, but it feels like, wow, sort of being in a room, the energy. And I know for those of you that are the our cantors and cantorial soloists, the singing into the ether and not hearing people's voices just must be so challenging. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts as we as the time clicks away? Anyone else want to share any observation about the topic? Jerry. I think one of the things that's been challenging about Zoom is as a teacher and as a director, I, I really try to encourage a lot of um, facilitation as a classroom structure, as opposed to teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher, student. And that's much harder on Zoom. 
So I'm still trying to figure out like the call on the person to your right when you finish or mm -hmm. doing more of the sort of heads up and encouraging conversation. And especially in some of my classes where they're small, you know, it's okay for you to unmute, but it's not okay for you to dominate the conversation. And some of that classroom management has shifted. And at the same time, I've also seen such incredible vulnerability and caring from students one to the other, where um, if someone's having a bad day, kids will reach out if um, after the check-in. If um, I was observing a seventh grade class and they had a guest speaker, they're still trying to do B'nai Talim online. So they had a guest speaker who came and talked about disabilities and a bunch of the kids talked about their own disabilities or the disabilities of their family members or siblings. And there was such incredible support and trust within that environment, even on the Zoom screen. And that was a situation where I almost wonder if they felt safer on Zoom because they were talking mm. from home. So it's interesting, I think, to juxtapose some of these different settings and really try to figure out what's working well and, um, and how to apply it with traditional methods of both teaching and mm -hmm. managing a classroom. Thank you for sharing that, Jerry. Really um, a beautiful reflection on your part. And I think, you know, for all of us during this whole period to sort of tap into our strengths as reflective practitioners to not lose the lessons that we're learning um, and experiencing during this whole time. Right, I am watching the clock, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I want to bring to everyone's attention our next session will be on December 21st. Um, it's the Monday of Hanukkah, I, I believe. Um, I think Hanukkah is still happening, maybe not. But anyway, um, Professor Jonathan Sarna will be our guest, and he's going to share with us, as I think everyone knows, Jonathan Sarna, um, you know, real gadol of American Jewish history. He's going to share with us some insights about how Judaism gets played out in the public sphere in America, in the United States, and sort of obviously with the discussion and conversations about, you know, what we, how we feel and do during, um, you know, periods of when sec the secular holidays or the, the Christian holidays take over in our public sphere. So it's going to be an interesting conversation. Really look forward to seeing you all then. I look forward to seeing some of you on Thursday night at our session and have a great week, everybody. And happy SIG where you can <laughs> and think about that music during the rest of the day. All right. Good to see everybody. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Michael, for sharing with us. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome, Andrea. Good to see nice you. To Have see you been driving you. this whole time or you're sitting still? Sitting in my car. Sitting in my car. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Glad I could squeeze You're welcome. In. Thank you, everybody. Good. Bye. Good to see everybody. Bye. Bye. Elena, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. See you're you welcome. Marion, do you have a minute? I do. Um, yeah, I do. Hi, Susie. Good morning. All right, bye-bye. I'll let you guys have your privacy. Thanks for another, <laughs> another great session. Thanks a lot. All right, Mike, I'm going to stop recording. Okay, uh, stop.